Are they doing it again? Are they doing it again? All the stupid comments about how this economy is just like 2008 and the prices are going up and Chris is over leveraging. Are they doing it again? That's it. That's it. We're going to settle this once and for all. I'm going to make a video. I'm going to put this to an end. Oh, people can be so stupid. One, 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 or one shot. Now the future for sure. Let's go. I'm turning dreams into reality. Yeah. It's one all one shot. Now the future for sure. Let's go. Man, I cannot believe how much confusion there is right now. Hello, 2020, 2021, completely different than 2008. I was there. And you know what? Today, I'm going to help you understand the differences between then and now, why it's entirely different. Because if you don't understand this, you're going to miss out in the next five years on one of the biggest real estate opportunities because you're going to think that we're in some kind of bubble or something. Let me tell you what happened in 2008, all those years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. The U.S. economy lost 2.6 million jobs. Why? Unemployment, 10%. Why? 3.8 million Americans lost their homes to foreclosures. Hello, 3.8 million. And what we experienced was a real estate bubble, and we also experienced a stock market collapse. And I gotta tell you what, the real estate market going bad and the stock market going bad only happens in two of every five recessions. They usually do not go hand in hand, but in 2008, they certainly did. This was a global financial crisis. It was felt all over the world. Now you gotta understand, 2008 was my first economic crisis. I started buying homes in 2003. By 2007, I had already bought 25 properties, financially free, quit my job. Everything was different. Back in 2007 and then 2008, I was going from buying dozens of homes to hundreds of properties. And when that crisis hit, literally everyone lost their mind, everyone went nuts, everyone thought that the sky was falling, that it was literally the end of the world. Strange thing is, during the next five years, I helped my investors make over $100 million. So for me, the worst of times was actually the best of times. But that doesn't mean a ton of people did not get screwed during 2008. What were the basic factors that built up to it? Listen, this stuff is super easy to understand. Number one, there were ultra low interest rates and low lending standards. We called it fog of mere loans. Like literally, if you could put fog on the mirror, they would give you a loan, or we call them heartbeat loans. If you had a heartbeat, the bank was basically saying, sure, here's real estate, here's money for it, and you don't even have to put money down. It was such, such crazy times. Number two, banks and subprime lenders kept up the pace by selling their mortgages on the secondary market in order to free up money so that they could do it more. So they were lending on all these horrible loans, packaging them up and then selling them off to investors at stupid discounts. So they were flooding the market with all these mortgages, bad mortgages, bad paper. And then number three, the financial firms that bought those mortgages repackaged them into bundles or tranches and then resold them to more investors as mortgage-backed securities. And when mortgage defaults began rolling in, the last buyers found themselves holding the worthless paper. And essentially this led to the real estate collapse. Now listen, the reason why some people out there get confused is because some things look similar, but there are also three big things that look different. Let's talk about the similarities first. Number one, the prices were going up. And everyone's like, oh, prices were going up in 2006 and seven and eight, and then it crashed. So right now prices are going up, so that must mean that the same thing is happening, just like in 2008, right? No, that would be inaccurate. Number two, interest rates are at an all-time low. And back then, interest rates were stupid, stupid, crazy low. And so based on these two similarities, there's a lot of people like, oh my gosh, Watch out, we're building this huge bubble. Don't listen to Uncle Chris. He's telling everyone to go into debt and get mortgages and it's gonna come screaming down like an avalanche and it's gonna destroy you. The reality is there are actually three major differences between the bubble of 2008 and the pandemic of 2020, 12 years apart. Number one, higher lending standards as in no income, no job, and no assets. These ninja loans were more common prior to the 2008 financial crisis. And in the aftermath of the crisis, the US government issued new regulations to improve standard lending practices across the credit market, which included tightening the requirements for granting loans. At this point, ninja loans are rare, if not extinct. In other words, like lending that was so easy back in 2006, 2007, 2008, 
those standards no longer exist. They not just tighten things up, but they're still tight today. Literally, even though we're in this weird housing crisis where there's not enough homes and interest rates are low, it's just as hard to qualify for real estate as it's been for the last decade. Now remember in 2008, there was a tranche of over 3 million foreclosures that came through the market. Is that happening right now? No, we actually have record low foreclosure rates. In fact, if you look here at Statista, it'll show you that over the last 15 years, we're sitting at the lowest rates possible. Now, I know what you might be thinking, Chris, what about the moratorium coming to an end, right? I mean, you've had literally 7 million people not making their payments. As they got to start making those payments, are they just going to default? Well, time's going to tell. But right now, statistically, it doesn't look like it. But probably the most important factor, number three, banks are leveraging less. Check this out. Return on equity, ROE for banks in advanced economies has fallen by more than half since the crisis. The average ROE for US banks now is only 7.9%. The tier one capital ratio has risen from less than 4% on average for US banks in 2007 to more than 15% in 2017. In other words, banks can't leverage themselves out as much as they used to. What this means is there's less leverage amongst banks, there's less leverage in the marketplace, and that means that there's greater security, there's greater safety right now in the lending markets. So clearly the 2008 crisis is very different than the pandemic that we've just gone through. So who is to blame for the 2008 crisis? Number one, predatory lenders. They were giving mortgages to literally everyone that could afford them and even people who couldn't. They did this thing called stated stated loans. You could literally just say how much money you made. They would verify nothing and say, hey, we're giving you money. How stupid. Stupid. Number two, investors are to blame. They bought those bad mortgages, they bundled them, and they resold them to other investors. Number three, agencies who gave those mortgage bundles top investment ratings made them appear safe. But there was nothing safe in those ratings. Those were high risk. That was bad paper. And then number four, the investors who failed to check the ratings or simply took care to unload the bundles to their investors before it actually blew up. In other words, everyone who participated in this game, you were to blame, you were greedy, and you got slaughtered. How is now different than 2008? I love this quote. Despite what you may have heard, we are not in a housing bubble, said mortgage billionaire Matashiba. He said, the housing market crash of 08 was the result of a faulty foundation the mortgage industry was built upon. The CFPB implemented significant industry reforms in the following years to prevent a similar collapse from ever happening again. It's still a great time to buy and more inventory is going to open up in Q4 of this year and Q1 of 2022. In other words, look at the stats. This may smell similar. It's entirely different. What does that mean? It means that right now, you should be out there borrowing money, you should be out there investing, but you should do a smart. You see, the problem is, most people are thinking, hey, real estate prices are going up. Either it's a bubble, don't buy, or they get greedy and they're chasing those prices higher and higher. And both of those are stupid. Stupid! So what should you be doing different right now? <laughs> Looks like every part of the country is becoming mini California. It's like, wow, here's a $250,000 house. It's now worth $400,000, $500,000. And everyone's just chasing these prices higher and higher. Instead, you should be investing in real estate, but you should do it in the markets where it hasn't capitalized and gone up yet, where it, you can still get that home for under two hundred, under $250,000. Those home prices, I believe in the next five years, are going to go up hundred dollars to $200,000. And there's an opportunity for gains where my typical ROI is like 25% a year on my money. It means that with compound interest, my money basically doubles every three years. Right now, it's happening at like double the place and in some markets, even faster than that, which is why I believe that in the next five years, we'll see more millionaires made in the game of real estate than we will likely see for the next several decades. And if you're not planning to become part of that, you gotta rethink your strategy. In fact, if you gotta catch up, if you gotta financially get ahead, you gotta figure out how to get in the game. So listen, if you got money sitting in a 401k, an IRA, if you've got a home where equity has been built up because it's gone up in value, you should be extracting those assets and you should be buying superior assets and getting those superior ROIs. If you don't know how to do that, there's a link below. I'll show you how you can partner with me. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. And I will take you hand by hand into the very best markets. And I'll fully automate turnkey the whole process of buying literally the best inventory in the world today where you are going to make the most money. The link's below. Get yourself educated.
there's a good chance you watch today's video because you're afraid of leverage. You're afraid of going into more debt and then having some bubble burst and then getting caught with your pants down. It doesn't have to be that way. You might be actually even thinking, Chris, I wanna get my house paid off. But you know what? There are three major reasons why you should not pay off your mortgage. And if you wanna know what they are, check out this video right here. And the moment I barge and say, hey, hey, are they doing it again? All I want you to do is, I, I just want you to look confused. Kind of look at each other a little bit like, uh, is Chris okay? Just a little like that, subtle, right? Just quiet. 